four million years later. Thank you for downloading and listening to the Four Million Years Later podcast, a show where a couple of friends get together and watch an episode of the Generation One Transformers series, and they get together and talk about it. Uh, a what? An episode by episode show about the nineteen eighties. Uh, Sunbow Transformers cartoon series. My name is Jersey Drost. I am a cartoonist and teaching artist, and the other host is... Hoover's here. Hopefully you guys listened to our Zero episode to sort of get the gist of what you're in store for here. Uh, Here we are at episode one, which is the number that comes after Zero. (laughs) Which is More Than Meets the Eye, part one. We're going to get into some weird numbering as we progress, because the first miniseries is a three-parter, and then the first season begins in in earnest after that, right? So, Mm -hmm. like, episode one of season one is actually episode four of the series. Eh, we'll cover it later. But episode one of More Than Meets the Eye. uh, So, you pulled a... um, a blurb, sort of like a, a, a TV guide log line of mm-hmm. what the, this episode is, a summary, as it were. Uh, I'll go ahead and read it right now. Um, as the Energon supply runs low on the planet Cybertron, the Autobots leave to find a new energy source. <laughs> Their enemies, the Decepticons, follow. After a vicious battle in space, vicious? Wow, we'll get to that. How vicious is this battle? Uh, both of their ships crash land on Earth. Dun, dun, dun. And this episode... Uh, many people's first introduction to the Transformers was written by George Arthur Bloom. And this was animated by uh, the Marvel and uh, Sunbow co- collaboration. So um, mm-hmm. it has very exciting storytelling. Uh, I remember being caught off guard by how exciting this cartoon was for me as a child uh, in a ripe old age of 10 or 11 years old. Um, so do we want to just start with the opening credits and just walk our way through the episode and react to everything? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, Sunbow, of course, had, uh, already done G.I. Joe at this point. So at least they've had a couple G.I. Joe miniseries under their belt. So they, they were no stranger to the boys action cartoons. Mm -hmm. So here we are with Transformers 1984. And what I really like about the opening is that... Not only is the theme sort of, it's almost mysterious sounding. Like it's just, I guess like the way it's sung and the way the voices are, it just sort of like sets the scene for the unusual setting you're about to get. Because at this point in history, I mean, it's 1984, robots were a thing We've definitely had Star Wars for, you know, a good portion of the decade at this point. Um, But, you know, a show about robots was still pretty new. And uh, Mm -hmm. they were clearly going to be the focus here rather than humans. Because in the opening credits, it's all robots all the time. Nobody else. Mm Mm-hmm. And it it starts with, um, like, this weird science fiction sort of blurp explosion noise and then kicks right into the strings and the percussion playing this dun 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 <laughs> and we see this these Autobot Decepticon symbols floating in outer space and then like as they fly toward us there's like cars on them and they all turn into robots <laughs> and there's like this cool 1980s like uh, science fiction grid which was like it just I don't know why but that look just seems to be married to the 80s <laughs> um and then the logo pops up, says the Transformers, and then the, the logo flips. It changes from red to purple. And then the Autobot, or the Autobot symbol next to the word trans turns into a Decepticon symbol. And then we fly down out of the sky. We see three jets transform, and they start. They turn into people. And that's what my grandmother always used to say. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go get you some of those cars that turn into men. <laughs> and they turn into people, and they start running at us, and they're shooting out of these cannons mounted on their arms. And at the front of the, the – it's the Seekers, and at the front of the pack is – Thundercracker, yeah. the leader of the Jets. <laughs> if, if you watch the opening only, you, you might get that impression pretty easily because not only is Thundercracker up front, but there's a lot of scenes with just two of the three Seekers in them and Thundercracker's in every single one. <laughs> and <laughs> you don't you don't always see Starscream. Sometimes he's just in the back. So it's like, yeah. I don't know if they were still deciding 
you know, which of these guys is going to be the most prominent in the show, or it's just happy accident, and the animators wanted to color in the blue one that day. Who knows? But uh, <laughs> but it kind of is interesting considering how little we really get out of Thundercracker in in the in the season. In the series overall, really. Yeah, totally. uh, but as much as, and we both love Thundercracker. This is mm-hmm. not a critique of the series. Yeah, uh, but so I'm not complaining but, by any means. Now, I know animation has gone a long way since then, but remember, we've got to put this in its context. Up until this point, you know, Sunbow action cartoons, even Sunbow early action cartoons, weren't that exciting. I mean, Spider-Man and his amazing friends, great show. Uh, not that energetic, right? right? Before that, even, you've got, like, you know, the Hanna-Barbera shows, like the Wacky Racers, Huckleberry Hound, things like that. Fun, not that exciting. This, <laughs> in, in the context of this... Uh, I would have to say, like, this and the opening to Mighty Orbots have to be, like, the two openings that, mm. as a child, almost felt like an assault on my senses. Because, <laughs> like, because it is just, it's it's 30 seconds of everything exploding and tr- guys turning from cars to robots and, like, jumping at each other. There's that scene where, like, Skywarp throws Jazz away from him in car, or, no, he th- throws Jazz away, Jazz mm-hmm. transforms into a car, then spins around and jumps right back at him in robot yeah, mode, you know? they're shooting at each uh, other, throwing each other. It's like, it's like pro <laughs> wrestling, but with robots. And yeah, huge it, guns. I, I almost was like the guy in the Blipverts episode of the Max Headroom show. Like, I was ready to explode watching this show. So, yeah, it, it starts off on, like, a very strong foot of, like, look at all the stuff that's going to happen in the next half hour. And I, <laughs> t- t- ten-year-old me leads and goes, okay, I'm ready. <laughs> I'm gripping the sides of the floor here. I'm grabbing handfuls of shag carpeting. <laughs> and I'm ready for what you're going to do to me. Uh <laughs> Now, now, just as just as a quick uh, compare and contrast, what's the opening of GoBots like? <laughs> it's not bad. It's not <laughs> bad. It's it's not as as exciting as this. Uh, I mean, it, and I should also say another thing that like I think GoBots shares a little bit of DNA with Transformers. Uh, we're going to talk about music quite a bit when we talk about these episodes. At least I know I am because mm-hmm. I I'm fascinated by season one's soundtrack. Um, because it does this really cool thing where it's like part orchestral, but then it's got electric guitars and some synth in there too. <laughs> it's the 80s. It was mandatory for synth to be involved. <laughs> but like you go back just three years before that and all action cartoons had full orchestral soundtrack, right? Black Star. If you listen to the soundtrack mm. of Black Star from Filmation, it was all orchestral. Lone Ranger, um, the Zorro show. Uh, but then all of a sudden like, 83 84 happens and like he man and the masters in the universe comes along thundercats comes along and transformers comes along and it's like we're, we're getting synth more into this stuff and it it makes it feel a little bit otherworldly and of its time at the same time right because like I, I remember when that opening sc- the score starts with the the opening credits with the the, the strings doing the dun 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 but then all of a sudden you hear that guitar uh riff play or like a solo play while the transformers logo pulls up on the screen um <laughs> So it 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 feels uh, yeah it, it, that that stands out to me too is like so like GoBots has more orchestral opening Transformers has that like guy going crazy on the guitar which <laughs> makes it feel more like and I mean when we finally finish this whole series and get to Transformers the movie like I don't know there was something about it like I had an older brother who was five years older than me well I have an older brother who's five years older than me and so he was like super into like Quiet Riot Striper Death <laughs> Leopard yeah. Twisted Sister and like I just remember thinking as a little kid like that's what grown ups listen to <laughs> <laughs> so hearing an electric guitar in the opening uh, sound soundtrack of the show made me feel like oh this is like suddenly we're in another play and this is a whole other game than he man mm-hmm. of the masters of the universe right yeah now we're like getting like you know this is a grown-up kids show <laughs> so <laughs> so and then it, it I, I also want to note that the ending of the opening credits ends with a familiar motif that i love in cartoon opening credits where the good guys and the bad guys rush at each other mm-hmm. you know they both fly to the mountain that the arc is crashed into at the end and they fly in from both sides and then the transformers logo comes out from the other side um, Challenge of the Super Friends has yeah, the same motif. That's, the that's what immediately attitude. came to mind for me. I love that. <laughs> I can't get enough of that. So anyway, love that. Uh, and then all of a sudden, Transformers logo pops up on the screen, then it goes to dark, and then what happens? So, yes, we pan down onto Cybertron, and we see all these really cool shots of the planet. And like the first thing I notice upon watching it again is um, it looks like this sleek futuristic world that is literally torn to pieces like there's bits of cybertron just hanging off of the world into outer space Mm -hmm. like it looks like it looks like it's been gored 
Yeah. Um, and, and yet it's uh, somehow beautiful at the same time. It's very unusual looking. It's very, yeah. I mean, t- of course it looks alien, but I mean, that's just the word that, that comes to mind. It's a very yeah. unusual looking planet. It's not just like a gray blob in space like Tatooine or something. It's just, it's clearly made of a lot of metal and there's like platforms that uh, are look unfinished or partially destroyed or something. It's it's a very interesting look, especially for mm-hmm. a planet. Yeah, I mean, it looks like a whole bunch of like skyscrapers emerging from some core and then there's all these different like levels of railway and roadway and then finally there's these patches on the top of flat pieces of metal sort of like put over top of all the layers but you can tell that this is a very dense and labyrinthine world but like just giant chunks of it have been taken off and then we could talk a little bit about um floro Derry, who did a lot of the concept designs for this series and whose sensibility as a science fiction uh artist I have been chasing my entire life. I mean, <laughs> literally. I, 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 there are comics where you can look in the backgrounds. Uh, Switch Runners was a comic I did back in what 2007, and like all the backgrounds are just like, what would Floro Derry do? <laughs> um, and I still like in a lot of my uh, projects I'm working on right now. I'm designing like inside of this like science fiction base, and I'm thinking about how he does like these weird round swooshes that lead into square ish shapes that almost extrude from the wall. Like they're not built onto the wall. It's almost like metal that extrudes itself into mm. uh in, in in organizing itself into these roundish squarish shapes all over the place um yeah i i really really uh adore his and i i still haven't finished unpacking what he's thinking when he's doing that stuff <laughs> um i've just been aping it for a long time so yeah uh, and and like his his character designs of the later uh 87 line of transformers uh i still really really love and in conjunction with these uh, beautiful designs we get an interesting little intro to the show mm. And uh, Victor Caroli is the narrator here, and he has that iconic Transformers voice that is hard to yeah. imagine Transformers without this voice being in the commercials and in this show. It's just like he is setting the scene here visually. He uh, basically takes the ball from Floro Derry's designs here and sets up the scene. Many millions of years ago, on the planet Cybertron, life existed. But not life as we know it today. Intelligent robots that could think and feel inhabited the cities. They were called Autobots and Decepticons. But the brutal Decepticons were driven by a single goal. Total domination. They set out to destroy the peace-loving Autobots. And a war between the forces of good and evil raged across Cybertron. Devastating all in its path, draining the planet's once rich sources of energy. The Autobots, on the verge of extinction, battled valiantly to survive. It's clearly, to me, borrowed a bit from the whole Star Wars premise in that the good guys are at a huge disadvantage here. Um, That's something that was really made popular in science fiction by Star Wars at the time. So it's almost like Hasbro was like, you know what? It worked for Star Wars. Let's do that. Let's have the good oh, guys yeah. be at a real disadvantage here so the they're instantly likable and you care about them. So that's an interesting way to start the show. It's not just typical like, oh, we're the good guys and there's all the, also these bad guys. They're struggling to survive. It's that sort of... They're underground. Yeah. Mm, literally. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and G.I. Joe, a real American hero, is they're the keepers of the peace, right? right? They're the upholders of the law. They're on equal footing with the villains, whereas in this, it starts out right away mm-hmm. that there's an energy crisis, and the Autobots have to sneak around, right? Yep. So Wheeljack and Bumblebee are coming out from this, like, tunnel with these weird, uh, what look like fluorescent lights, yep. Um and th- these things apparently have a little bit of energy in them, and they're just trying to hang. They're like, okay, well, I guess this is all we can find, and we got to take this stuff home. These are um, these are just the overhead lights from Wheeljack's lab. They're just fluorescent <laughs> tubes. <laughs> and if only he would have remembered to grab his Cosmotron while he was there. Oh, so uh, a little bit of reference. foreshadowing. <laughs> when we get to that episode later on, divide and conquer. Okay, but yeah, so they um they you know 
load up, he transforms into his vehicle mode. Now we see that Wheeljack has a mode that, is, that doesn't look like what the toy in our lap has right mm-hmm. now. He turns into this weird floating minivan type thing. <laughs> Instantly they show us that, hey, these are indeed Transformers as we just chanted over and over in the opening credits. Um, Wheeljack here is uh, brought to life by Chris Lotta. And you have mm-hmm. Bumblebee portrayed by Dan Gilveson, who recently had been Spider-Man in uh, mm-hmm. the Sunbow cartoon. And so these two characters are essentially our first introduction to Transformers. And they're on screen for like a total of like 10 seconds or so before Wheeljack transforms. So it's like they're not wasting any time. They're not beating around the bush here. Like these guys are robots and they can transform. Yep. Something I know we're probably both going to hammer on about about this whole series in in this regard. This is in relation to just Sunbow's storytelling style in general is they're just so darn economical. They just don't Mm -hmm. waste any time Mm -hmm. getting to everything you need to know about a premise or a character within seconds. So here we are. Cybertron. Ravaged world. Here's the Autobots. They they uh, they're battling valiantly to survive uh, on the verge of extinction. Are battling yes. battling valiantly to survive. And here's two of the guys. They clearly don't look like big warriors. Bumblebee is awfully cute and small. Um, and here we go. We're, I'm going to transform into a van. Now we're transformers mm-hmm. and l- load up the the stuff. Let's head for Iacon, their home base. And he says we're nearing the bridge to Iacon. <laughs> <laughs> and we get to one of my favorite things about the first miniseries is the the vehicular puns and the odd measurements of time and, and distance, right? Mm-hmm. We're nearing the bridge to Iacon. One mega mile to go. You don't just drive miles in Cybertron. <laughs> you drive mega miles. Mega and miles. That implies that the miles are in space. <laughs> Well, it has alliteration in it, so that makes it feel extra, like you know, designed and thoughtful. But yeah, like I, I think uh, Astro Seconds come along later mm-hmm. than the first miniseries. But yeah, I and we'll talk about Astro Seconds when we get to them. But yeah, I, I do love like some of the the, the odd science fictiony language they introduce in this that feels kind of like well we'll figure it out later <laughs> what's a mega mile? i don't know is, is it a breen or is it a Vorn or an orin i don't know we'll figure it out later also it's it's that 80s sort of storytelling where it's like we'll tell you what the things are it's a mega mile you don't need to ask any questions that's right that's right I, I, like as a kid i struggled with it i was like what is it you know but as a grown-up i'm like i don't care it's a mega mile it's, 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 it's a space mile and then they pay for things in space simoleons um so while they're going their last mega mile Wheeljack says, "Uh uh-oh. And he says, a Decepticon welcoming committee. And then uh, he pulls up this, like, all of a sudden this weird black shield, like, sort of extends from his base fins to cover Mm -hmm. up his whole front end. And then we see the jets. And I know you you have opinions on this because we see three (laughs) Decepticon seekers, which are clearly Starscream, Thundercracker, and Skywarps just standing around (laughs) waiting for Autobots to drive by. And, And what do they say? Uh, well, it's it's. I really like how Wheeljack says a Decepticon welcoming committee. It's like, hey, kids, these guys are Decepticons. It's like introducing <laughs> them to us almost. <laughs> but they're really setting up the, there are two different factions here. These guys yeah. are the Decepticons. They're bad. And uh, our first look at the Decepticons, we see a handful of Seeker-style jets. Uh, seekers being a term that has been basically appropriated by the fandom that came from apparently of all places a catalog like a christmas catalog um typically we would know them Uh. as uh starscream thundercracker and skywarp but the one that we know as starscream has a real gravelly voice here and so it's probably not starscream or meant to be starscream it's just supposed to be another generic seeker because what they love to do in this show is have multiple seekers around and put them in different colors. A lot of the times, the uh, typical Thundercracker, Skywarp, and Starscream color schemes are just repeated. So multiple characters walking around in those uh, color schemes. So this gruff-sounding boss is probably not meant to be Starscream here, uh, but he sure looks like him. Autobots, get them! <laughs> and then, uh, again, going to the music, this is one of my very favorite season one tracks 
uh, mm-hmm. which has been called. It's on YouTube. You can find like the whole soundtrack has been like sort of reverse engineered and pieced back together um, without the uh, talking over top of it. But this track was called "Emergency," and mm-hmm. it's 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 so. Uh, I don't know. It 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 takes me back to watching the show as a child and it didn't get, it didn't get used past season one. Like they dropped it right after season one. And, mm. um, but it has like, and it's called emergency cause it's got like this siren kind of feeling to it. This, uh, and, and then also like this, like building tension of the, while the siren part is playing, like these low horns come in and go bump, bump, bump. And they get a little faster, ba ba bump, <laughs> and finally, then it kicks into the full refrain. Yeah, and that's when uh, Wheeljack says, "You know, mind if I cut?" In? Oh, well, before Wheeljack says, "Mind if I cut in?" We get like three other colored jets show up. Yep. <laughs> one, one of them, them has a flamethrower. Flame of all things, <laughs> <laughs> you think on a planet mainly made of metal, a flamethrower wouldn't be too uh, useful, but apparently, it is. Well, it's, it, it's very it's hot. It's not fire. just a flamethrower. It, it creates a perfect circle around uh, Bumblebee and Wheeljack and, and puts a little wall of fire between them. Yeah, and there's a line here, too, where I, I do remember as a child like feeling like, oh, the show has history. Um, is yeah. that Bumblebee says, Prime told me there'd be days like this. And then Wheeljack mm-hmm. laughs and says, oh, you didn't believe him? He's like, well, I do now. Mm-hmm. So they're referring to some guy that we haven't met yet named mm-hmm. Prime. And like Prime has been, you know, warning Bumblebee that there's danger in the world out there, and this is Bumblebee's first encounter with it. You know, all of that comes through in that just that little line of dialogue. Uh, and as a kid, I remember that really excited my imagination. Okay, there's more people we're gonna meet, and there's like a, a broader, a, a deeper history to not just like the, 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 the battle between these characters, but between the characters themselves. Yeah, which to me feels like a very maybe mature is not the proper word, but it, it's a very well-told uh, intro to the series, I guess. Because, I mean, if you think of, say, other cartoons uh, a little bit before this time, like Super Friends, say, any of the Hanna-Barbera-type hero shows, this feels a little bit more serious and j- just a little bit more tense, whereas the stakes are higher. Uh, maybe it's uh, partially due to the fact that clearly the heroes are at a disadvantage here, um, but it feels a bit more serious. Like this isn't this isn't just your typical Super Friends episode where you absolutely know the good guys are going to win and Luthor is going to look like a jerk at the end and the good guys will win. That sort of typical cartoon thing. Um, this is it's almost you're not sure if the good guys are going to win because they're at a complete disadvantage. I have to also wonder if this has to do with the fact that there was no promise that this was going to be a regular series when we watched Mm. it. Right. So like it felt more like a movie, a cinematic event. And so I feel like the, the cliffhangers in the series affected me more than Mm -hmm. they probably would have otherwise. If I thought this is, Oh, this is a regular weekly show. Like once the show became syndicated and became like an after school show, um, I felt like, I wasn't as invested in the cliffhangers as I was mm. when I watched this. Good right? point, because you know you knew it was coming back, you know, tomorrow. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Well, clearly they have to get to a sort of situation where things are kind of calm again, if not hit that uh, storytelling reset button so we can pick up mm. tomorrow from this thing. But when it's just a three-part miniseries, it's like, well, they can do whatever they want. They could have the bad guys lose in the end if they really want to. <laughs> mm. Uh so Wheeljack makes these weird little fans come out of the front of his car mode, and Bumblebee transforms into a car, a little cute little flying saucer thing, and they blast through the fire, and then the Seekers take off and turn into these cool fluorodary pyramids and start shooting at our heroes <laughs> as they're trying to drive their last mega mile. And what happens to poor old Bumblebee? Bumblebee! Get in quick! You all right? Yeah, I... I think it's my rear axle. Well, hang on to your crankshaft. I'm shifting into overdrive. So now as the jets finish their hunt and the good guys get away, we get to hear the actual voices of the proper Decepticon seekers. Yeah, they're colored like Thundercracker and Skywarp, and they sound like Thundercracker and Skywarp, so this is probably the actual Thundercracker and Skywarp. You have Thundercracker portrayed by John Stevenson, and Skywar portrayed by Frank Wilker. And the interesting thing about that is that John Stevenson was sort of a mainstay 
in uh, cartoons, like simple ones like Top Cat and that sort of thing. He, he'd been around the industry a long time. Yeah, John Stevenson was a character actor on shows like Perry Mason, um, mm-hmm. Alfred Hitchcock Presents. Um, yeah, he was in, at least in two episodes of Perry Mason, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> uh, so, Yeah, so he, he had been around Hollywood and, and starred in dozens of things. Oh, Dragnet. He did the closing credits on Dragnet with the on, on July 12th, trial was held in Superior <laughs> County of, in and for the city of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. <laughs> and we have Skywarp portrayed by Frank Welker, who is most of the Decepticons in season one, but we'll, <laughs> we'll get to that. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. But yeah, so then we better get back to Megatron. And then now we get, I think this is our first Autobot Decepticon simple transition. Yeah. The very famous. That, that's more than meets the eye transition. I mean, it's like this, this is a mainstay of the show. The scene changed. That's, that's an interesting, just sort of like reiteration. Like, okay, guys, there's good guys and there's bad guys. We're going to be switching between them. We know they all look like robots and it's going to be hard to tell them apart, but we're going to help you with that because here comes the Autobot face and it's going to switch to the Decepticon face. It, mm-hmm. it makes me wonder, like, how much of that was just storytelling device and how much was, okay, guys, you know, they're like leading us uh, by the hand through the uh, different robots in this series. It's like, just in case you weren't sure, maybe you're not Mm -hmm. a regular viewer. And of course, no one is in episode one yet. But this little red symbol, those are the good guys. This little purple symbol, those are the bad guys. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, I mean, you could do that with music. You could do, and they do do this with music in uh, mm-hmm. this first miniseries too. Is they do that that Wagner esque thing where like the good guys and bad guys have their own themes, but um, but yeah, it, it, again, I I come at this as somebody who makes comic books for a living, and the the job of a cartoonist, to quote Ernie Cologne, is to achieve clarity. And so this just feels like a really nice device just to emphasize clarity. And I don't remember mm-hmm. when I noticed that that was what they were doing. I do remember that at some point or another, I noticed that, oh, okay, when the Autobot, mm-hmm. when it ends in the Autobot symbol, we're going to Autobot headquarters. When it ends in the Decepticon symbol, we're going to a scene with Decepticons. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I, like I said, I don't remember when that realization occurred, but at some point I did notice it. And, you know, I think it's a, a lovely little narrative piece of uh, storytelling to help propel things forward and then also make sure that you you are not confused at any point. It really is, and I can't think of like anything comparable in any other cartoon. I mean, there might be a little sort of dun da dun da da moment, but it mm-hmm. would just have like the logo. You know, it wouldn't mm-hmm. be like it wouldn't be a transition from like good guy to bad guy. There wasn't anything comparable in any other show. It's kind of interesting. Yeah, like a visual thing that doesn't take much time, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Like in, in the Super Friends show, you would have had the announcer saying, "Meanwhile, at the Hall of Justice." Right. But, yeah. But other, uh, but but it wasn't like a quick little visual flash. Just like that's trusting that you're paying attention. Mm-hmm. So that was good. So like a trans- transition happens, and then we see Wheeljack coming home to Iacon, and he passes by these two odd looking little things leaning over the road. These what are, what are those things? Well, I you always know? called them lamp posts as a kid. Okay. <laughs> they okay. just seemed like uh, street lights or something. Maybe they were communication towers. Who knows? It's up for interpretation. They buzz right by, and then once they're past, one of them turns into a robot. Dun dun dun. <laughs> so this is the first time we ever see Soundwave. Yeah. And uh, the guy's a lamp post. <laughs> He's a lamppost who talks like an ELO song. <laughs> <laughs> Soundwave voiced by Frank Welker, probably the most iconic voice in all of Transformers. It's just as a kid, I think everyone sort of fell in love with that effect where mm-hmm. it's like, oh, wow, he really sounds like a robot. Like like yeah. we all had a, a pre-existing definition in our head of what a robot would sound like. So we're like, <laughs> yeah, that checks out. That's exactly what a robot would sound like. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we all turned to each other in the audience and nodded authoritatively. <laughs> yeah. Like, yes, yes, indeed. Mm-hmm. Very much robot voice. And a, a, a nice thing they did is that he's a tape deck. He's a music character, even though he's the communications officer, which we'll get into more later. Because like, it's like, wow, he sure has a lot of responsibilities for somebody who's only in charge of communications. But um, the fact that he turns into a tape deck 
and they, they added that vocoding effect. But in, especially in this first miniseries, they were very musical with it. Like the the the, the tonality of it changes a lot during his sentence, his his speech. Mm-hmm. Um, so like I, that also connected with me. Like it, it's, it doesn't just sound mysterious and robotic and eerie because like you don't know how he feels about anything. He doesn't emote, right? Right. Um, but it also has that kind of like musicality to it, which makes him feel even more weird. Hmm. Yeah, he's not talking like Wheeljack and Bumblebee were just a few minutes ago, or even Skywarp and Thundercracker. He's basically saying a lot of statements and facts and tasks he's doing. He's not emoting in any way. Right. Yes. Yes. Uh, laser beak eject operation. Mm-hmm. Uh, what was it? Assimilation. I, I forget what it was, but he tells Laser Beak go spy on the Autobots, but he does it in this very um, well. Like a, he's he's. It's almost like he's speaking code. He's speaking like mm-hmm. if the if this then that commands. To <laughs> but he has this cute little guy come out of his chest. Yeah, this and, is the first we ever see of that, and that's yeah. an interesting little idea. It's like. It's like, oh, a bird came out of the man's chest. <laughs> that that does that, that's worth stopping on and considering right. for a moment. That somebody came up with this idea that he's got all of his tapes inside of his body and he can just call upon them at any time to be like little helpers for him. And that a that the character who would have a family of little friends living inside of him would be this mysterious weirdo with a with a non emotional voice. Guy. Who, yeah. And a bad guy. Yeah. Like all of that together equals fascinating. And that's all of us kids leaning in going like, why, 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 why? And I don't think we ever get an answer with him. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it all adds up to fascinating character. Um, so laser beak comes out, transforms, and he's kind of a bird, kind of not a bird, and <laughs> which we can go into later. Like when, you know, Teletran one fixes everybody, he evidently scanned a, a bird to make laser beak <laughs> into the bird that he was which means wait a minute what did rumble turn into on cybertron doesn't matter mm. doesn't matter that's 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 for a fanfic for another time but <laughs> laser beak goes and he's um he's spying and then uh what, what oh oh and then sound waves like oh autobot alert mm-hmm. there's an autobot coming and he turns back to a lamppost and we see jazz go by in cybertron mode and then sound wave transforms back into robot mode says disclosure averted continue observation we follow jazz into iacon gets on uh the elevator rides up to optimus and we get another vehicular pun any luck jazz negative no side of cybertron's blacker than the inside of a drive shaft so jazz played by Scatman Crothers mm-hmm. of, of The of Shining the and <laughs> I know, maybe films, that's where you're gonna go <laughs> but The Shining is usually the one that everyone thinks of yeah, that's true. Because I, I remember seeing The Shining as a kid going like, wait a minute, that's jazz. Why, why is he in this really scary movie? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Scatman Crothers isn't really like going out of his way to disguise his voice by any means. This is pretty much the Scatman Crothers voice. Yeah. <laughs> and when you sound like this, why would you disguise your voice? So you wouldn't. That's so true. That's, that's true. not a dig by any means. No, no. You flaunt, flaunt what you got. Um yeah, and and we also now we meet Optimus Prime, and there's a couple other Autobots on the in the elevator with him, right? Yep, Optimus is flanked by Prowl, portrayed by Michael Bell, and Trailbreaker, who's portrayed by Frank Welker, because he apparently cannot voice enough characters in this show. Mm-hmm. And Optimus, of course, is voiced by Peter Cullen, and this is the first time we ever hear from him. So this they establish here that while Laserbeak's listening to them, they're like, you know, they're talking out loud about their problems. Like, well, we don't have enough energy. We're not going to be able to win this war. Well, actually, Optimus mm-hmm. says no one's going to win this war. Right. And then, mm-hmm. and now it's like, well, there's nothing for it. We got to leave the planet to go on a search mission. And then as soon as Laserbeak hears that, he flies back into Soundwave's chest. Soundwave takes off with a rocket blast noise. And then we cut right to, I think it's we get the transition symbol again. And then we cut right to our big bad. <laughs> Here's Megatron, folks. Here's what we've all been waiting for. The big well, bad of the Decepticons. Here he is. We see him. Uh, uh, Soundwave comes in the little elevator door and Megatron's there with Starscream. <laughs> Megatron, of course, portrayed by Frank Welker because, again, he can't grab enough of these voices. Yeah. Starscream <laughs> is Chris Lada. Yeah. And... Uh, as we'll see in a second, 
Shockwave is there, voiced by Corey Burton. Corey Burton doing his, as he uh, explained it, doing his best David Warner impersonation. <laughs> uh, David Warner, the British actor who played uh, evil in Time Bandits. He played the bad guy in Tron. Uh, he played the <laughs> photographer in The Omen. Um, and you, could, the moment he, I heard him in an interview say that, I was like, oh my gosh, yeah, that's all I hear now when I hear Shockwave's <laughs> voice. But yeah, Megatron is like talking to the camera. <laughs> The Decepticons got to get the energy first. <laughs> Just in case you were unclear what was going on, kids. This is war. We're fighting over energy. We need it pronto. The stakes are high. Yeah, yeah. If if the Autobots find new energy, we got to get it first. And then uh, Soundwave comes in, says, "Okay, the Autobots are good to go." And Megatron says, well, "Okay, well, let's go too." And then he calls to Shockwave, who is in gun mode, stand is like up mm -hmm. on a platform at the top of their headquarters and well this is this is a very memorable line for me uh, <laughs> so Megatron knows that he's going to take the gang and pursue the Autobots wherever they're going because they may have a lead on energy so Shockwave transforms and Megatron essentially says okay we're leaving you man the store I trust you to watch the planet while we leave. And, you know, Shockwave's cool with that. That's the great portrayal of Shockwave. He's, he's very, very cool customer. He's never really excited by any means. He's just always sort of on an even keel. So Megatron places him in charge, and we get this. Shockwave! What is your command, Megatron? You are to stay behind. I entrust Cybertron to you, Shockwave. Fear not, Megatron. Cybertron shall remain as you leave it. Excellent. This is an important line because it's not going to come back mm. into play for like several episodes. Mm. <laughs> oh, but we'll be talking about it then for sure. Yeah, it, yeah. But yeah, Shockwave, he's, he's a robot of his word. Um, so yeah, so n now we get to uh, Megatron sort of like ruminating on like, ah, any second now I'm going to win. I'm going to finally win after all these millions of years. And Starscream starts giving him some uh, sass back. <laughs> So instantly we're brought into this sort of relationship where so far we've seen all the other Decepticons are pretty referential to Megatron and they do what he says and, you know, inform him and take orders and all that good stuff that you want in uh, an army. But Starscream, not so much. Yeah, th th this is one of the, the key theses I picked up out of the show, which was whether it was intentional or not. Um, I mean, but I mean, Megatron's file card says peace through tyranny. I mean, he's a tyrant. Mm -hmm. And so he surrounds himself with these people who are just utterly loyal to him. Shockwave, you stay home. Don't let anything happen to the place. You bet. <laughs> I will not let anything happen to this place. And we'll, as we'll hear later on, like uh, all of his soldiers are like, Megatron's okay if I do this? Yes, I give you permission to do that. Okay, I'll go do that. Mm -hmm. um, but Starscream is the one guy who is like, you know what? You're not so great. As a matter of fact, I might have some better ideas than you. Um, <laughs> And I think this is why he's such a memorable character because in this, in this, he's surrounded by people who think that Megatron is the best. And there's there's something in our psychologies that says like if a thousand people like say like this is the best, you go, well, I don't think it's the best. What's wrong with me, right? Like you immediately begin to wonder like, am I not seeing something that they're seeing because they all seem to really enjoy this thing? Starscream has the uh, the self. Uh, sort of like like self confidence. At least that's how it came across to me when I was eleven. It felt like self. I pointed to him. I was like, "That must be what self confidence is," because he looks around at all this guy and says, "No, you're all wrong. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I, they would. The Autobots would have lost if it wasn't or if if I was in charge. You know." <laughs> and what I really love is that Starscream actually turns to the screen as Megatron's yelling at him. He, he <laughs> <laughs> Almost like to say, viewers, you think I should lead, don't you? <laughs> it's funny that's how, that's how you read it. Because like, I always read it as like, he can't, well, maybe this is me looking at it as an adult. He can't look Megatron at the eye, in the eye when he's actually confronted on his statements. Mm -hmm. like, 
my 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 grown up interpretation of Starscream is that no, he doesn't have the courage of his own convictions. He's he's hoping that nobody calls him out on it. He's hoping that if he makes a big enough noise and acts big enough, people will just fall in the line. But he doesn't <laughs> have he doesn't have the chutzpah to back himself up, as we'll as we'll see in like many episodes down the road. But so I always read that, or I read that scene now as him being like, oh, he's he's looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like that a lot. But I also like the idea of him looking at the camera going like, kids, let's all vote. Call 1-800-655. Vote for who should lead the Decepticons. <laughs> Only $4 a call. <laughs> the Autobots would have lost eons ago if I'd been calling the shots. Starscream. Only a select few ever leave. My time will come, Megatron. Never. Never. So, um, it, it, it now something else that I mean I know we've all noticed, but I think it's it's worth thinking about when we rewatch the show again. It's just how uh, bo- vibrant and clear the designers are with all this stuff. In the sense that whenever we're in a Decepticon scene, everything's purple, and we're, whenever we're in, we're in an Autobot scene, everything's orange. Right. Mm. What is orange? Orange is the color of sunlight, life, warmth, heat, <laughs> strength. Purple. What's that? The color of it's the color of mystery. Wizards wear purple. Right. Mm. Um, yeah. It's like you think about like like purple is often associated with like not not necessarily evil, but things that are dangerous and unpredictable. Yeah. So like they, they're very, they were very clear with these color schemes to make us kids watch it going like, well, yeah, those are good guys. Well, why? Well, I don't know. It's just it, it, you see it. You can tell. Mm-hmm. Um, Another so, sort of visual shorthand to throw at us. Yeah. 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 Like the, in the Decepticons are all cool colors. The Autobots are all warm colors and so on. Um, yeah. I, it's another thing that, you know, I just I really adore about this series. Um, so. After this fight, Megatron says, like, let's let's get ready to go, and we cut back to the Autobots, right? Yep, we have the Autobots in their shuttle, orange, of course, and they start taking off, and Megatron's plan is to follow them because they're up to something. <laughs> Look at the shapes of the ships, too. The Autobot ship mm. is like a, like a, it's like a rounded crescent with like some little straight bits on it. The Decepticon ship is all like these twisted uh, spikes and triangles all poking out in various directions. Mm. So even with the shapes, they're telegraphing like, okay, these are bad guys. We can tell cause it's all pointy, <laughs> and, you know, and the good guy ship is all roundy and, you know, round is more approachable anyway. Yeah. And we have a couple more Autobots uh, are shown to us for the first time. Mm-hmm. We have Mirage voiced by Frank, Frank Walker. <laughs> Apparently Who's can't doing do his... enough. <laughs> and, and I, I heard in an interview too, that his, and I never realized this until I heard the interview that, Mirage is his Gregory Peck impersonation. <laughs> like it, 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 it baffled me as a child. I'm like, why does Mirage talk like that? <laughs> you know, but but like when you when you hear it through that lens, like, oh, he's doing a Gregory Peck impersonation. Now I get it. Now it makes perfect sense. And also shown to us for the first time here, we have Ironhide, who becomes a very important character, voiced by Peter Cullen, a very zesty Southerner type. <laughs> So this is where we get to, uh, you know, a, a story that's very similar in the cartoon and the comics is they encounter a meteor shower. Like like two, as luck would have it, poor Optimus, you just have all the worst luck. Uh, two giant <laughs> meteors or asteroids crash into each other and explode into uh, an asteroid field or meteor shower, as Soundwave says it. Meteor um, shower, meteor yeah. shower. And, uh, and so... <laughs> This is a lovely... Okay, something we're going to talk about a lot on the show is the kid logic of the show. I know this isn't how it would work, where, like, Optimus tells Ironhide, man the laser gun, and just <laughs> fire, and it just forms, like, this fire blast in front of the ship that just carves a path through the meteor it, it shower. It just <laughs> annihilates anything in its path. It just It's just like the Photoshop erase tool. We just erased all the meteors <laughs> directly in front of us. <laughs> To my little eleven-year-old brain or ten-year-old brain, it didn't matter. It just looked cool, and it, it, I got, I got the idea. They're they're escaping this dangerous situation where there's rocks smashing the ships up, and the Decepticons follow them, tractor beam, and then they, you know, board the Autobot ship, and we get this this fight. And 
I think visually it's very interesting because they go out of their way to show a lot of characters sort of facing off. It's like, here's another character we haven't seen yet, kids. Here's another one. These toys are all available at your local store. Please go down Tell and your parents. buy them all. Mom, Dad, <laughs> I need all of them. Yeah, so there's clearly a good handful of Decepticons, a good handful of Autobots. It's like wrestling broke out. Yeah, it's pretty much it's it's just like a bunch of fist fighting on the ship, and then all of a sudden they got caught in the gravity of this weird blue planet, and then the Decepticon ship, which is like linked to the Autobot ship with tractor beams, like spins off and flies off into the distance. Uh, see it? We don't actually see it crash, but it just flies away, and we see the Autobot ship tumble down. Optimus tries to recover the flight, but they crash into a volcano which is apparently on Earth, and that's our first act break, right? If I'm not yep. mistaken, that's the first cliffhanger. Yep. Correct. So the Autobot ship is crashed into a mountain. The Transformers will return after these messages. We now return to the Transformers. And so we come back from break, and boop. This this really like like kind of cheerful, almost mischievous music starts playing as we look at the mountain. It, like it, like when I hear the music, I almost feel like it's like this is the music that should be playing when Bumblebee's sneaking around and like stealing mm. Energon goodies. Um, it, it it has like this little like uh, flute noise of like this, and then like there's this oboe, this. But um, we, we see the words four million years later appear on the mountain. <laughs> <laughs> background changes so four million years have passed volcano erupts that's a lot to unpack that's four million years worth of stuff to unpack it's like okay clearly uh what we were seeing on cybertron was a long time ago it's four million years ago mm. why from a storytelling point of view does it need to be four million years that's a big number. It's not like a million years later. It's four million years later. What that feels like to me is like a placeholder. Like, uh, we'll go back later and figure out an appropriate amount of time. And then they just never went back to it. And it still says four million years later. I am not a Transformers historian, but if I remember right, the comic used the same time frame. Am I, am I yeah, correct? I think you're right. I think so. So that ha- that leads me to believe that this was somehow in the Hasbro sort of mm-hmm. Bible of the toys like that. And that like some executive just came up with that as like, you know, <laughs> a lot of time, yeah. it, you know, X amount of time, oodles of time happen. And then they wake up mm-hmm. um, but for, for, for me as a child. What that said to me is like these creatures are incredibly long lived mm-hmm. and they're advanced because back, you know, before even way before humanity was even like dumb cavemen, these robots could think and feel, you know? Right. So they're far more advanced to us. And if we really want to get persnickety, go back to the line when Starscream says, the Autobots would have lost eons ago if I'd been calling the shots. Well, is he exaggerating? Or does he really mean like he's been around for eons, right? Um, So now we know he wasn't exaggerating. These guys can live for a very, very long time. Or can they? Because that, as we're listening to this cheerful music playing, we're panning across the the the, the bridge of the Ark, the vehicle that crashed into the mountain, and there's a bunch of like not just un- unconscious Autobots and Decepticons; they're like they're ripped apart. <laughs> 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 they're like it's it's like if, from a robot's perspective, this is like Saw Two just happened <laughs> in this room. <laughs> So yeah, there's that carnage, and then thankfully that volcano they crash into it explodes, and yeah. it exploding jars the ship enough to where the computer comes online. Mm-hmm. Teletran one wakes up, and and does a very famous line that we all remember. Explore, explore. <laughs> Megatron, my leader, we are alive again. Quickly, we must revive the other Decepticons. 
This was a very memorable line for me. I I can't even point to why, but I remember as a kid a lot of the time going, explore, explore. Mm -hmm. I guess just because uh, Teletran in comparison to the other guys, you know, those were robots. Teletran is, you know, a computer, but how different from that is a robot? I don't know. Mm -hmm. You know, it's (laughs) I know. It's 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 very splitting hairs, but uh, just <laughs> just I I liked that line for some reason. Yeah, a lot of people I've talked to about the series over the years, like people who haven't engaged with it in, since they were children, remember that scene specifically. Mm-hmm. And and the scene is Teltran One sends what we learn later on is called its Sky Spy, this little satellite that flies around the Earth, and is exploring to look for compatible life forms to give the Autobots and Decepticons new alt modes, which. I'm not sure why, except, well, I mean, Disguise, which they talk about later, but I also have to, if I'm going to really, like, you know, hypothetical and and interpreting what they didn't intend, um, the fact that whenever an Autobot gets hurt, they always ask, can you transform? I wonder if vehicle mode has something to do with the healing process, right? Mm. Like, there's some something built into them. Their alt mode is not just to provide them with a disguise and new abilities, but also, like, that's some kind of, like, um, form of stasis to help them their automatic healing systems work. See, kids, I told you we were going to overthink things. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm raising my hand over here saying, yes, I'm the guy who was trying to write a uh, Palladium role-playing module for Transformers <laughs> so that I could role-play Transformers with my friends. But um, but yeah, because like what, what Teletran 1 does is that it, he uh, the Sky Spy floats over an airbase, scans a F-15, I think is what that fighter jet is, and then uh, it this little like beam comes out of the computer and like starts hitting various characters in the room and the first one it lands on a sky warp and it puts sky warp back together as a f-15 fighter jet yeah of um, all characters it's interesting that sky warp was chosen to be first imagine had it been starscream would starscream yeah. would have what if would starscream have dragged anyone else around or would starscream would just be like well i guess we can throw away all this trash <laughs> well, I, I know in my fanfic he would have tried to pick like somebody who he thought was the most like potentially loyal to him, right? And it would have backfired on him because they'd be like, "No, we got to wake up Megatron." He's like, "You're not waking up anybody." And then they'd get into a fight. Starscream would trip be like, and fall oh, on something. Oh, Megatron must have flown out the air duct. He would have definitely <laughs> hidden the body before he woke anyone <laughs> yeah, up. Yeah, he totally would have. Yes, he would have swept them behind a rock. Like I don't know, <laughs> he's not here. So I guess I'm in charge now. Like, no, nope, we're not gonna we're not gonna rest until we find Megatron. You know, <laughs> so it's it's very <laughs> helpful that very loyal Skywarp was first to be fixed. Who yeah. who in his first act of being a transformer on Earth drags Megatron over so he can get fixed. Yeah, and Megatron. Interesting that they don't show him get turned into his alt mode. Right, the mm-hmm. beam just hits him and then he just sits up because like I feel like Megatron's alt mode is like left as a surprise in this movie right. series. I agree. So, yeah, he wakes up Megatron, and Megatron's like, okay, we got to wake everybody else up. And so they put all the Decepticons under the beam, and then they fly out of the arc, and they look around, and Megatron makes a startling deduction. (laughs) Much time has passed. Oh, boy. Talk about uh, (laughs) understatements. Well, then again, I mean, you know, if they're long-lived robots, I mean, four million years might just uh, be a a good uh, weekend bender for them. Who knows? Who knows? It's quadrillions of astroseconds, though. And then he's like, uh, you know, we'll, we're going to find out if this place has resources. We're going to build the ultimate weapon. <laughs> like, where did that come from? It's not All wasting you said before any was... time here. He, you know, he's been asleep for four million years, so they got to get in gear. That's right. That's right. Uh, so, like, before I was like, we need a lot of energy. Okay, well, I get that. You guys are really low on energy. But now... I'm not only going to get a lot of energy, but we're going to build the ultimate weapon and conquer the universe. And as he's walking away, ruminating on this thought of how he's going to build an ultimate weapon, this is where we get to an observation about Starscream. Once again, uh, is that Starscream, I feel like the writers, whether they meant it or not, Mm -hmm. he is this statement of how the enemy of totalitarianism is the individual. 
right? Mm. Because Starscream is always acting. At, I I don't think the writers were necessarily thinking this out loud. If they were, <laughs> it was something that was happening in the back of the brain. They were just doing this as a job. It was a kids show. They weren't trying to make any kind of weird, um, you know, Orwellian kind of statement. <laughs> but 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 I infer this as somebody who's <laughs> thought about this show for a long time. Um, you have this 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 tyrant and his uh, his group of utter yes men you know com- completely signed on to the to the vision of the, the the tyrant and you have the one individual in the organization who stands out and what does he do as megatron's walking away with all of the decepticons happily following him starscream turns around and starts firing on the autobot base pewty pew pewty pew pewty pew and then we get and now we get uh, once again the way megatron always addresses this character right he doesn't just say like hey come on starscream <laughs> <laughs> buddy (laughs) like he always says his name the same way right (laughs) scream like he doesn't say he doesn't talk the way to sound wave right like that would be also in my fanfic is like starscream dreaming about like oh just once i wish megatron would say my name the way he says sound wave's name Like even even like when he comes back from the dead later on, spoilers. Uh, when Galvatron sees him, what does he do? He, he screams his name, right? He never <laughs> says his name. Like, oh my gosh, it's Starscream. Um, but he yells at him, Starscream, you know. And he's like, oh, I'm just saying goodbye, you know. Um, which is like a playful little thing. He's just being playful, like in this kind of malicious way of like shooting at the base <laughs> or the, the ship of the Autobots. Uh, but he's like, yeah, thanks for the ride, Prime. Too bad you can't go the rest of the way. And as he shoots, rocks fall down rumble the ship and optimus who is like laying comatose gets tossed by the the vibrations into the beam of teletran one who's you know the repair beam thanks for the ride farm too bad you can't go the rest of the way explore explore Thanks. Yeah, way to go, and, Starscream. You just woke up the Autobots. Good move. And not just like, oh, he woke up Gears who can't drag any of the bigger guys <laughs> into the beam. Good point. Right? Good point. <laughs> Imagine who, he, who, he wakes up Huffer is like, ah. <laughs> well, Huffer was actually one of the stronger minibots. He was like, yeah, but he's too busy or... having a, a, a mental crisis to do anything about it. <laughs> It's no use. Uh, <laughs> why even try? But, uh, but <laughs> we'll talk more about Hoffer too. But um, but yeah, like so he wakes up Optimus, and I do love like I, I love the first miniseries uh, interpretation of Optimus, where he's like he's really casual, he's kind of John Wayney, and mm-hmm. he's 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 not quite the sort of finished developed fatherly character that he becomes in season one right in this one he's he's he, i feel like he's optimus like he's 29 or 30 year old optimus right where <laughs> he's, he's still i mean he's not quite a young punk right he's 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 experienced at this point and he's got some mm-hmm. wisdom but he still has kind of like cool teacher vibe to him right yeah because <laughs> he turns to tell Charlie, he's like hey thanks and he gives him a thumbs up <laughs> <laughs> Oh. Thanks. So then we go back to the Decepticons, and uh, you know what is what is Megatron doing? I wasted no time. It's time to let's let's build ourselves a little frat house. We we live here now, I guess. So let's <laughs> let's build a house, and we'll start to find energy, and we're gonna get all the energy we need, and the end, because the Autobots <laughs> are all dead. We're just going to do whatever we want, and no one's going to boss us around. So he sends Starscream and Soundwave off to build a base, essentially. And then Starscream's like, well, I'll need some help. And then we learn that Soundwave has another little guy living inside him named (laughs) Rumble. Yeah, and Rumble uh, is performed by another voice actor, right? <laughs> oh yeah, they they found a whole new voice actor for this. Some guy new to the industry. No, just kidding. It's Frank Welker again. I'm just <laughs> imagining like when they're divvying up characters for this new show, Transformers. It's like I imagine like the voice actors are c- kind of like streaming into the um, the recording place, and 
you know, someone's like, oh, I think I'll take this character. And then I imagine like almost like little trading card uh, pictures of each character are available. And Frank Wilker just like walks in. He's like, I'll take this one. I'll take this one. I'll take this one. I'll take this one. I'll take this one, too. I'll also take this one. I'll also take this one. And everyone's like, dude, what are you doing? <laughs> like he's cutting the line at the buffet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you can't argue with him. I mean, he does a spectacular job with everyone he portrays. So, like, well yeah, done. you can't you can't hear the similarities between Megatron's voice and Rumble's voice. No, like they're, they're, I mean, they're Skywarp t- and Rumble. Yes, Skywarp's Skywarp's just like Rumble in a couple years. Yeah. So I mean, yeah. there, there's that <laughs> difference between them. But but I mean, if if they didn't tell you, you probably couldn't figure out that Megatron is Skywarp. And is Trailbreaker and, you know, all of that. He does a good job differentiating his voice. Yep. So as they take off to work on their building the new base of operations, we cut back to the Autobot base. And we have Optimus uh, walking thoughtfully in front of all of his troops who are all lined up Mm -hmm. to say, like, look, they're all fixed. They're all here. Yeah, they're all fixed. They're all here. They're all available at your local store, kids. You can go buy (laughs) any of these guys right now. Go do it. Parenthetically, at the end of every line of dialogue in the show is tell your parents, kids. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Because uh, uh, then he turns like, well, we got to, you know, the Decepticons got to, like, this planet's rich with sources of energy. The Decepticons got to know this. So we got to find them and stop them before they get it. So he says, Hound, you know, and we meet Hound, who is played by Ken Sansom. Mm Mm-hmm. Interestingly enough, he's the only voice actor who on IMDb from uh, the Generation 1, Season 1 cartoon. He's the only one without a photo. Hmm. I did not know that. I don't know if he didn't work as much as the other guys or what, but uh, he was pretty much the only one there who did not have a photo next to his name. And then we see Cliffjumper portrayed by Casey Kasem, an 80s staple. That's right. Voice of Shaggy on Scooby Doo, America mm-hmm. Top Forty. Um, yeah. So, uh, and and here we're going to get to something that happens a lot in this first mini series is where like Optimus tells Hound go find him, see if you can locate the Decepticons. Mm-hmm. And Cliff Jumper doesn't say, "Hey, Optimus, is it okay if I go too?" Right? Mm-hmm. He's like, "I'm going too." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and then, so like, Megatron is totalitarianism. Optimus is democracy and democracy is like it's messy right because like, cause like <laughs> you get guys like cliff jumper like i'm going to and optimus like all right i guess you're going I, it's <laughs> fine i didn't say that for you to go i didn't order you to go but but if you're gonna go just find them don't yeah. do anything else like as if he knows right it's like it's right. like uh, uh, darth vader turning to boba fett saying no disintegration yes like, j- it's exactly <laughs> the kind of same thing it's like whatever you do cliff jumper don't pull out a bazooka out of nowhere and fire on him <laughs> I won't. Fingers crossed. <laughs> but but it, yeah, it's it's one of those things where he's like he's he's saying like, look, kids, you don't know about this guy yet, but I know about this mm-hmm. guy. Yeah. He's got a hair trigger. He gets into trouble. Easy cliff jumper. Just find him for God's mm-hmm. sakes. Don't do anything else. Like you can hear mm-hmm. it in his voice, right? So they take off, and then we cut back to Starscream and Soundwave and Rumble. Mm-hmm. And we have uh, Rumble talking for the first time. Hmm. Someday I'll be giving the orders, Rumble. You'll do what I say. Look, Star Scream. Megatron is strong. He's merciless. He can't be beaten. And you'll never be our leader. I will find a way. Everyone has a weakness. Yeah? Well, not Megatron. We shall see. Yeah, so, so Star Scream is very open about wanting to be leader. <laughs> He's not hiding that little fact from anybody. He's and... he's the guy who can't wait for Christmas. He just can't <laughs> stop talking about it. It's like Starscream, it's Halloween. It just, just, we're, not, we're not there yet. <laughs> oh, I can't wait. <laughs> but uh, we see from Rumble that he Rumble's view is that Megatron is too powerful. No one could take him down. Why would anyone want to try to take out Megatron? Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, Starscream even says, like, everybody has a weakness. And like, yeah, well, not him. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so it's like, once again, we get this this reinforced idea of, like, all the other Decepticons really think Megatron is the best. He's mm-hmm. the best. You can't you can't beat this guy. Don't even think about it. Stop yep. thinking about it. Just fall in the line, right? And that's, once again, this is the, the, I think that's what made Starscream such a compelling character for me as a child, is that 
if you're if you were in your classroom 10 years old and every kid in there said don't do it mm-hmm. and if you still had the 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 chutzpah to step forward and be like oh, i'm gonna do it right right like that that looks like courage when you're a child so so then we uh we we go to cliff jumper and hound so now it's like some time is passing because cliff jumper and hound are driving along and we get this nice little line where it's like hound's like sure is different than cybertron and that can mean a lot of things. Sure is different than Cybertron. It's really gross. Hate it, you know? But <laughs> There's all this but, dirt everywhere. But Cliff Jumper says, don't fall in love with it, Hound. Like, and when you read Hound's file card, it's like, yeah, he secretly wants to be human, you know? It's like, oh, like they, they're just, it's a lovely little line of like, yeah, Hound, this happens every time. We go on a mission and you want to stay on this world. You belong on Cybertron. Don't fall in love with this place. We're not staying here that long, you know? But then, like, you know, they, they climb a ridge, they see the Decepticon base under construction, and clearly some time has passed because Megatron is back. And there's, like, half the building is built. And they're like, what are they doing? <laughs> and now it says, let's find out. <laughs> let's get down there and bend some metal. Ease off your throttle, Cliff Jumper. Remember what Prime said. Just find him. And so... You know, after Megatron basically says, like, anybody listening? Here's my plan. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that could not have been the, any a better time for Hound to overhear what Megatron was saying. <laughs> that That's like all good spies. You know exactly when to turn on the, the spy machine and listen. But, um, you know, Soundwave says we can, oh, hey, I got an idea. We'll make these things called Energon Cubes, which, um, you know, uh, uh, we as viewers didn't know about, mm-hmm. but... They're talking about it in a way that suggests that this is a new thing. Right? Yeah. It's like Soundwave has uh, copyrighted this <laughs> secretly. <laughs> He's sent, sent off the information via Buzzsaw to the Cybertron <laughs> patent office. He's like, hmm, Energon Cubes, huh? Hmm. W- which we, we know is, is actually run by Ratbat on um, Cybertron. <laughs> there's, there's, a, there's a little bit of a deep cut for you Transformers fans. <laughs> <laughs> he was a bureaucrat. Okay, so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so Soundwave comes up with energon cubes, and he thinks, uh, you know, we'll store the store the energy there, and then we'll take it to Cybertron, and yay, we win. <laughs> and then we get to one of the like probably most oft spoken lines by Megatron. Mm-hmm. And don't think I won't be counting them as we go. I'll be tabling up how many times he actually says this. Or will you, or will Cyclonus? <laughs> That's another deep cut right there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> How ironic. By leading us to this planet, the Autobots have sealed their own doom. That's one. So this is too much for Cliff Jumper, is that, <laughs> uh, that, that Megatron is making fun of the Autobots behind their backs. And so he pulls this giant cannon out of nowhere, which I feel like that's the thing that Transformers can do, right? Like, this, let's mm-hmm. just accept the fact that Optimus's trailer goes someplace, Soundwave grows because he t- does something funny with his atoms. Megatron gets small because he does something funny with his atoms. They can <laughs> do this. It's fine. Yeah, they change shape and size. You know, it should be nothing to pull out a bazooka out of, out of thin air, more or less. It's like, if that's the hill you're going to die on a- as a fan, it's like, mm, there's plenty of better hills to die on. <laughs> The, the thing I keep coming back to is that these shows have a lot have, have something in common with poetry. And if you take poetry literally, mm. it breaks, right? And if you the moment you ask how does Superman fly, you've thrown away something fundamental to enjoying what it's about. So and, 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 and also there's no glory in like pointing out these logical inconsistencies, right? right. Nobody's gonna be like, Whoa, you got it. You noticed it. <laughs> you figured out that there's something weird about this kid's show that was being cobbled together by a whole bunch of people really rapidly in order to meet a deadline. Uh here, here's your here's your Nobel Prize. <laughs> so <laughs> it's a kid's show. He pulls out this giant cannon and uh Hound's like, What are you doing? And he's like, I got Megatron dead set in my viewfinder, and he fires and he didn't have Megatron to send his viewfinder. <laughs> Apparently, Cliff Jumper is not a sniper. <laughs> nope. He's too excitable. And who could be firing on us? And I love that line from Thundercracker where he's like, <laughs> Who even who knows? Else knows we're here? <laughs> he just he, he so sounds like like guys that I worked at Burger King with. You know, it's like, <laughs> Hey, hey, buddy. How's it going? 
Uh, <laughs> then we get like, you know, it, Starscream again. The individualist is like, it's, it's got to be the Autobots. And then Megatron's like, no, it's not the Autobots. <laughs> but they're the only ones. They have to be. So now we get to see Laserbeak in Earth mode. Send Laserbeak to go f- investigate. And he's launched. And Laserbeak chases Hound and Cliffjumper. And uh, what happens next? They, they, they transform and run away, right? Let's burn rubber. What is that thing up there? I don't know. But we can't seem to shake it. Let's split up. It can't follow both of us. Right. At least one of us will get back to Prime. Accelerator down. (laughs) Eat my desk, bird brain. And now we get to the second cliffhanger of the first episode. And this one, I do remember, this one had an effect on me. So like when Hound gets shot and falls off the cliff and we hear the, no! You know, and then it plays like the the scary music, the attention, the tense music, and <laughs> yes, that one. <laughs> and then Laserbeak flies overhead over Hound's smoking remains. You know, uh, as a kid, again, I didn't know if this was going to be a regular series or not. This was just like some kind of like special event animated feature. I'm like, oh my gosh, the guy who talks like Jimmy Stewart is dead. <laughs> Cliff Jumper. <laughs> you're you're an old lady, Cliff Jumper. <laughs> yeah, but he doesn't really do like the the Jimmy Stewart like oh what 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 no 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 he doesn't do like that stammering but he's got like a little bit of a Jimmy Stewart vibe to his voice but anyway so we come back from commercial break and we see Ratchet's there Cliff Jumper's there and this weird <laughs> orange construction vehicles there yep. And Cliff Jumper calls him Hauler, and they're trying to pull Hound's body up from the ravine that he crashed into. Hauler, pull him up! Hauler, Hauler. Okay, there was no <laughs> Autobot named Hauler in the 1984 <laughs> line. So I'm imagining like 10 year old Hoover like flipping through his Transformers right. catalog that came with right. the figures. I have like, the catalog right in front of me. But he's not. Swipes, I don't see streaker gears. Bumblebee. There's no holler. What's going on? There's a huffer. There's a huffer, but there's no holler. There's no holler. There's no dad, mom. There's no holler. There's no holler. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but he looks just like an Autobot that comes out in 1985 named Grapple. Right. So my guess is, and I've never read anything confirming this but it seems like a, a originally hauler aka grapple was probably due to come out in 1984 rather than 1985 but there was just way too many toys already and i would mm. guess that uh, maybe uh, reflector was sort of the same way mm. i would just sort of assume that reflector and quote-unquote hauler were due to be released in the initial wave cut out um, but cut out too late in the game for them to be removed from the cartoon. So here we get this one little scene with Holler hoisting Hound up from his crash. And then Hound who never is not see dead. him or hear from him again <laughs> until season two when he returns from his vacation in Britain and he decides to call himself Grapple. We shall remember you, Holler. We shall remember. <laughs> <laughs> so Ratchet is voiced by Don Messick. He was a very uh, uh, prolific actor in cartoons. You hear his voice in a lot of different shows. He was Scooby Doo, wasn't he? I think so. And he was, uh, yeah, he was like in a bunch of Hanna Barbera shows in the Super Friends series, and yeah. Um, so yeah, they take Hound is okay. He's at least he's going home for repairs, and then we cut to um, one of the weirdest Decepticons <laughs> hanging out with Thundercracker. Uh, and I know you have boatloads of wonderings and theories on this character, but we cut we cut to like Thundercracker and Reflector just like hanging out like on a rock, just like looking around. Yeah, but the weird thing about Reflector is he's not one guy; he's three guys, <laughs> and he's not three different guys. He's three guys who all talk in unison as one guy. Played by Frank Welker. <laughs> played by Frank Welker. No, no, he's not. He's played by Chris Latta. <laughs> oh, we had you going. 
Although yes, it would this, be very are... understandable for Frank Walker to uh, grab up three additional characters <laughs> who are actually only one character. This character is voiced by Chris Lotta, who also does yeah. Starscream. So he's he's basically doing the Starscream voice, but very monotone, and it's tripled. So he all three of them are speaking at once. Why is Reflector the one guy who does this? Well, I mean, obviously the toys came before the show. That's just what his toy was. Three robots who turned into one camera. That's just what it was. Maybe mm-hmm. that's the reason why they left him out of the first line, because it was too weird and different from everyone else. I don't know. But the toy came first, so it's three robots who make one little camera, and that's that's another added weird thing to it. It's not three robots who turn into a jet. It's... Right. It takes three <laughs> robots to make one of the tiniest alt modes ever. So that makes it even weirder. But in typical Hoover fashion, I sort of like, in all my ruminations of Reflector, I wondered if I possibly could have stumbled upon a p- possible origin of why Reflector is like this. You know, it's just that dope sky warp dragging everybody over to the uh, the little glowy place on the arc when they're rep- when they're repairing everyone. So, what if when he was supposed to drag over one person at a time, he was just like, "I'm tired of dragging everyone around. I'm just gonna throw these three guys down at once." What if the way the teletran one was supposed to work is just scan one person at a time, but then there's three robots dragged up there by Skywarp, and it's like, Teletrion 1's not going to argue. It's like, huh, three robots? Okay, I'll find an alt mode for them. So <laughs> that's my exciting secret origin of Reflector. He was originally three different guys, but now he's been reformatted by Teletrion 1 into one guy. And so really, he's the first combiner. Yep. And that's my fanon. Well, I, what, what I love about most of your fan theories about this show is it usually involves one of the characters being lazy or irresponsible or inattentive. <laughs> yeah. It's realistic. It always comes, it always comes back to like, I don't want to do all that. And they do something else and it causes this other thing to happen. Uh, but yeah, that it is an interesting, he is an interesting character in that, right? Like he is three transformers who have to work together to become one thing and it's not even a vehicle it, another observation about the original series is there are most of the cars are like everyday cars you would see on the street which was kind of exciting in a way mm-hmm. because like when i'd go on road trips with my brother it'd be like oh let's see if we can spot Ironhide. there he is you know yeah um but now like in in more modern uh iterations of the toy line like they often make them more into Eh, things that look kind of like modern cars but aren't really modern cars you know like or have like a militaristic kind of vibe to them like bulkhead in transformers prime was a military vehicle right. you know ratchet turns into an ambulance but he's kind of like I've, I've never seen that ambulance in real life you know it's like this weird like military ambulance yeah um and you certainly don't see transformers who turn into everyday appliances like a camera <laughs> or a tape deck you know mm-hmm. So you know, that that kind of adds to the fantasy mystique of this is that there's a guy who turns into a camera. There could be a transformer in the room with you right now, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, but yes, and then there's we get the scene a scene where they're like Reflector and Thundercracker just like kind of talking about work. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it's also kind of telling that it's them. It, yeah. it, this is also way reading into it, but it's like if there's any two Decepticons who like the rest of the guys at the base would want to like kick out of the base for a while. It's probably these two guys. Right. Because <laughs> there's the grumpy old man, and then there's the weird guy who talks in threes. And uh, let's, let's send them on a mission quick. <laughs> I do like that idea that like, yeah, like Thundercracker's like, he's going out for a smoke break. You know, like, like and the reflector's like, I'll come with you. He's like, oh, I guess. Fine. <laughs> I get you want to gossip? You want to gossip about Megatron? Sure. <laughs> I can't believe the Autobots survived. Hmm. Neither can Megatron. They thought he'd blow a fuse when he found out. Hey, what's that? Let's find out. <laughs> okay, Reflector. 
Let's see what you can see. So now we get to uh, Thundercracker takes a picture of this vehicle, calls Soundwave on the phone, and says, you know, I, I, I see something that could be an Autobot. And so they say, release Ravage. Yeah, and, and we as new viewers, we don't know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> right. What's a Ravage? <laughs> Is it like Zod and the GoBots? Is it a giant monster? <laughs> but no, Ravage just turns out to be yet another character voiced by Frank Welker. Only this <laughs> one is another little guy who lives in Soundwave's yeah. chest. And this is a Jaguar. Yeah. And we cut to two, like, apparently construction workers. Most humans <laughs> in the show at this point are construction workers. Um and we get the two guys getting out of the car and like, I don't understand it, Joe. Played by Corey Burton. <laughs> I don't understand it, Joe. Looks like a tornado hit this place. I, I don't like it. Something's wrong. Real wrong. <laughs> and uh, yeah, Ravage like just jumps out of nowhere. I don't think we do. We we never even see Ravage transform. No, right? It's no. like just release Ravage, and then like the two guys are surprised the way we're surprised when this robot Jaguar jumps out of the rocks and like starts messing them up. Um, I don't understand that, Joe. There's a robot Jaguar attacking <laughs> us. What do we do? I don't know why, but when I was in my twenties, that line just cracked me up so <laughs> bad. I mean, so so much so that like when I was working on a short comic for Antarctic Press, and I was working on it with a uh, writer Tom Root, I really pressed on this idea that like let's have the guy from this episode show up and be like he's going to be a cop who's like I don't understand, it, Joe. It looks like a tornado hit this place, and then like but and like he keeps on finding all this evidence of something that happened there, but he just keeps saying I don't understand this, Joe. I don't understand that either, Joe. <laughs> I don't know why, but it, it tickled me to no end. And like, I really had to beg. I'm like, look, Tom, it's funny to me. Can we just leave? He's like, yeah, but the readers, the readers won't understand what you're talking about. <laughs> it's art school girls. Number one, which ran in magazine in 1998. If you really want to track it down. <laughs> the deepest of deep comic book cuts. <laughs> yeah. So the humans get away and Ravage is like, oh, he's burning with anger because the humans got away. And then we cut back to the Autobot base and we see the Hound is being fixed and Optimus is consulting with him as to what what did you hear? And that's all we heard, Prime. They're going to put the energy in some kind of cube, then haul it back to Cybertron. So you got to put it in some kind of cube. Yeah. Not, they're making energy on cubes, Prime. We got to stop them. It's like, no, right. they're going to do something with some kind of cube. Yeah, this isn't just the introduction of the audience to Energon Cubes. This is the introduction of the Autobots to Energon Cubes. Yeah. So apparently Energon was just in a different kind of form on Cybertron until Soundwave trademarked and copyright the Energon Cube process and <laughs> made this new whole thing. Yeah. So now we get to a scene where Tell Your Parents Kids is yes. stated oh, every boy. couple seconds or so. Uh, Jazz organize a battle unit. We're going after them. Quick observation in this miniseries, Jazz is apparently the second in command, mm -hmm. uh, which according to his file card, I believe that is correct, right? He originally was like sort of the ops guy. He yeah, was, I think he it was, might have been mentioned on there. Um, but like this quickly gets thrown out in the next se season. But at least in this one, we get to see what it looks like with Jazz being the second in charge. He's not doing any rhyming. He's not doing any kind of like like uh, jazzy talk. He's really just like being a straight up second in command mm -hmm. officer to Optimus in this, which is interesting. And he starts calling out all the exciting characters and vehicles you can purchase <laughs> at your local Toys R Us. Now available or... at your local store. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. So we see Cliff Jumper, Prowl, Trailbreaker, Wheeljack, Ironhide, Mirage, and Sunstreaker and Sideswipe. Well, even though they don't speak, we have Sunstreaker by Corey Burton and Sideswipe portrayed by Michael Bell. And again, we get to this whole formality of Jazz as a character where he like he gets everybody to transform first, then he says, Start your engines. And they all start their mm -hmm. engines. Then he turns to Optimus, he's like, Ready, Prime. Like, we just don't see that anymore after this first series. It's very mm -hmm. like Jazz is trying to keep these guys like whipped into a, a military unit, right? Yep. Um, but then they 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 all take off, and there's this lovely animated scene of the cars all driving towards the camera uh, as we get to the transition to an oil platform, right? Mm -hmm. So Laserbeak has been reconnoitering and found out that there's this this oil platform where they the Decepticons can steal a whole bunch of energy, and we 
see like this slow pan down from the sky and we meet our human characters that we're going to be following for the next three seasons, two seasons. And unfortunately it's not Joe and his friend again. <laughs> I don't understand it, Joe. How I do still we don't oil? understand it, Joe. How do we get on this oil, Derek? <laughs> I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> now that would that would be like if if we ever get around to it a robots in disguise uh yes. character like with the green-haired lady they would, they would be recurring characters showing up at various locations <laughs> not understanding what's happening to them <laughs> but this is not that instead it's just that. our heroes spark plug and his son spike spark plug played by chris lada spike played by Corey burton and they both work on this oil derrick together. Not oil derrick, it's an oil uh, drilling platform in the mm-hmm. middle of the ocean. And Megatron and the Decepticons are flying down. He's a dive, dive, and they all land on the platform. And the humans very valiantly uh, repel mm-hmm. them, right? <laughs> yes, humans use their vast powers to throw things at the giant robots. <laughs> They've never seen giant robots before in their life. Their idea, not to cower and tear, all right. Let's throw things. Anything around here, let's throw it at them. <laughs> yeah, like you hear the guys go like, everybody, come on! And they just start throwing wrenches and things. <laughs> That's pretty great, actually. I mean, I'd like to think that we would be that courageous that if giant menacing robots showed up, they would be like, all right, this for you. <laughs> right. <laughs> I, I, got a, I got a box of snap-on tools here with your name on it, buddy. <laughs> and a deep, 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 deep cut. As the Decepticons dive, this is the first time in the series we see a light purple Seeker jet. Uh, and that'll come back up. That'll come back up soon. But this yep. is the first time we ever see a light purple jet on Earth. Especially in this miniseries, you will see Decepticon jets in a variety of colors. Uh, it happens less in season one, but in this one, uh, but but it still happens a little bit. But in this one, this miniseries in particular, holy cow, uh, purple jets everywhere. <laughs> um, but yeah, they dive down and they uh, <laughs> Megatron like just like picking up giant pieces of his construction equipment, just like throwing it at him, knocking him off of the platform. Yeah, um, yeah, you, you literally see like a good handful of human construction workers like. <laughs> sail off the barge into the uh, into the water below. Yeah, and maybe they die. Maybe they don't. Who knows? <laughs> yeah this this series more so than GI Joe, uh, like left the fate of human life a little bit more ambiguous. Right. Mm-hmm. Um. In, in, in there's another episode coming up that we're gonna talk about where like it, it, they cut it in just such a way where it's like, ooh, I think those guys got blown up, but they just <laughs> didn't show it. Um, but like this, yeah, he takes this gigantic piece of conduit, like tubing, like, like the size of a person, like it's as tall as a person, as wide as like two school buses and just throws it at him. And they like tumble over it as they fall off of the oil platform and fall into the ocean. And then we cut to, um, spark plug who's being like choked by rumble. (laughs) We always knew rumble was a little guy because he came out of Soundwave's chest, but we never really had a comparison shot until now we see rumble is like six or seven feet tops <laughs> and so he's basically basically like human size so he's able to basically take take on spark plug and spike and traditional like fighting rather than uh whipping out any lasers <laughs> And so Spike very bravely runs up to this robot and punches him in the back of the head, which doesn't do anything because he's made of metal. <laughs> and Rumble just like turns around and is like, yeah, get out of here. And Spike <laughs> falls in the water. And then Spark Plug goes after, like pushes Rumble off him and goes after Spike. Spike! And then, <laughs> yeah, he's got a very, he's got a very uh, wet mouth as he says, like, Spike! <laughs> then Megatron turns to Starscream and gives a command that gets used a lot in this miniseries and Whole sort lot. of drops off the map afterwards. Starscream, activate the null ray now! Activate the null ray. Not just Starscream, use your null ray, or Starscream, activate your null ray. It's Starscream, activate the null ray. <laughs> the null ray, yeah. I mean, visually, it just seems to be. Starscream use your arm cannon. <laughs> right. But uh, I don't know if it's like a special mode Starscream can put his arm cannon in that it's not typically in. I mean, that would be my little fanon, but uh 
<laughs> so so this is where I took a page from your playbook and I was like, what, what, what's, this, what's the no ray do? Why is it doing that? So I quickly consulted the file card, which was in mm-hmm. the Transformers universe uh, comic mm-hmm. books. Yeah. That were released in the '80s, and I looked. I went to the Starscream entry, and it's like it said the null ray did something that stopped electrical flow. I'm like, okay, but like, mm-hmm. what's that got to do with like making energon cubes? Like, they never explain it. It's just like it's it's up. It's a a fundamental part of making energon cubes is he hits the machine with the null ray, and then Soundwave makes the cubes come out of his chest, with which they then fill up with the oil. And this is where we get to like. We never see this again. This is only in this miniseries, right? They mm-hmm. they fill the cubes with the oil, and then what do they do? <laughs> they push it down. They're compacting the oil within, I guess, maybe like in order to transform it into uh, whatever Energon is, be it a solid, liquid, or gas. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's like, yeah, they, they add pressure to it, and then it turns the oil into this multicolored glowing substance. It's not the purple glowing stuff we typically think of when we think of Energon. It's like, it looks like a, a kaleidoscope of colors, right? Yeah, very Inside, pretty like, effect. Yeah, it's cool looking. I mean, it, it really does look neat, but yeah, it's like, they're not cubes anymore. They're like more like Energon plates. <laughs> but then Starscream's like, yeah, we did it. We won. <laughs> we're, we're done here. <laughs> and Megatron doesn't believe that that's the case. <laughs> so like he he basically says what he's like he's like uh well this is if this is like one location how much more does this planet have right and now i'm in greedy child mode where i'm gonna be like mm-hmm. gustav from uh you know willy wonka like uh, uh, too much is never <laughs> enough we're gonna drain the whole planet dry and then the, the individual starscream ever looking around never being content with with himself notices that the autobots are coming it's and- the autobots who are flying. We yep. got to talk about this because this is an important thing that, that changes between this, uh, these episodes and the other ones is the Autobots are flying to the, the scene. I guess they realized that the Autobots could not drive to a, a oil platform in the middle of the sea. <laughs> so they were like, hmm, let's have them fly. But, but they're Autobots. They can't fly. Shh, 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 cartoon, cartoon. <laughs> Yeah, uh, mixed feelings on the flying business. I'm I'm actually kind of glad that they got rid of that. I I like the idea of the Autobots being uh, at a disadvantage in as many ways as possible, right? And yeah, uh, I, f- I feel I, I feel it's understandable to have them in time come to be able to fly. I think that's fine, but here they are flying through the air, no problems whatsoever. And Megatron, this is where we get our big reveal, like right at the end of the episode of like what is Megatron's alt mode. Yep, and he t- turns into a Walther P thirty eight, but robot sized. So he mm-hmm. turns into a gun and lands in Starscream's hand, and Starscream fires on the Autobots. And Starscream is about as good as a marksman as Cliffjumper was, and so the Autobots <laughs> just sort of move out of the way, and then they all square off on the oil platform. And again, it's like, hey kids, look at all these different robots you can buy. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of a lot of fist fighting and, and hand-to-hand combat happening on the oil platform. And then Megatron like pushes Optimus away, right? Like he transforms back to robot mode and they start grappling. But then mm-hmm. Megatron pushes them away and then he like shoots out one of the legs of the oil platform, right? Yep. So you have Megatron blow up the platform and he's like, you know what? Why do we gotta wait here fighting when we could just split with our ill-gotten gains? Yeah. From a storyteller standpoint, there's a really lovely shot here where he shoots out the leg of the platform. The Autobots all spill into the ocean. And then Megatron says, here's something to keep you warm. And he shoots at one of the big oil uh, containers on the platform. It explodes like another one nearby explodes. And this, there's a shot of like a, a three quarter up shot at looking at Megatron as he laughs at them. And then the fire is like sort of overlapping his face. It's like this hellish kind of image of Megatron rejoicing in the death of his enemies. Right. Yeah, And that's and all- that's the great thing that they're portraying here is like Megatron is not just out to serve himself. He's going to revel in defeating his enemies. He's going to get a lot of joy out of it. Yeah, yeah. That's the kind of villain this guy is. Yeah, with that, with that famous, famous laugh. It, it's it's even hard to imitate. It's got that, like, that, it's almost like a giggle, but it's like mm-hmm. a, a devilish giggle. Yeah. <laughs> 
So, and as they fly away with the Energon cubes, Optimus and the other Autobots are floundering in the water, and then they hear a noise that will become <laughs> part of the punctuation of the Gen 1 Transformers series from now until Doomsday. <laughs> Coming closer! I can't lift it. Too heavy. Grab onto me. Keep your heads above water. That's one. Help! 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 <laughs> I remember years ago, was it you or me? I forget which one of us put together a supercut of all of the helps into like <laughs> one audio track. <laughs> I don't remember, but I, th- I think we're definitely going to do it as this podcast progresses. <laughs> There's a lot of help, help, help. But, uh, I mean, after all, they're trapped underneath, like, this giant uh, metal frame in the ocean, and there's burning oil on the surface of the water all around them. Um, yeah, I think it's fair. I think it's it's reasonable. <laughs> it's definitely a situation where you could reasonably be expected to yell for help. <laughs> Yeah, and so Optimus can't lift it. It's too heavy. He's like, hold on to me. Try to keep your heads above water. And that's the cliffhanger. The Autobots in the ocean that's on fire, <laughs> and all, and there's all these little humans that are trying to trying to survive, and you know, and the Decepticons got away with all the energy. Yep. Um, that th- this feels like th- they just teed up. This is what the show is going to be about from now on. It's going to be about the Autobots always being hamstrung by the fact that they are ethical and moral and have to you know, uh, do the right thing. And Megatron will always have the upper hand because he's surrounded by guys who will do exactly what he wants and he has no scruples and he will jeopardize whoever he needs to in order to see his, his means come to an end. And his only weakness is Starscream. Mm -hmm. So that tees up the entire series here. We have the end of episode one, more than meets the eye part one, I think brilliantly executed intro. I mean, it basically sets sets up the plot of what the show mm-hmm. is going to be about, what's going on with all these characters, what are they doing, mm-hmm. what are they like. As far as uh, introductory episodes go, I think it's pretty amazing. Well, and it does it does it in a way that doesn't that keeps you interested in that. Like it starts with the fight, right? Like we start on Cybertron, the fight, fight, fight. Look at all the cool stuff that's happening. Look at all the cool animation. We get a couple lines from a couple different characters, and now we're on Earth. Now let's take our time. We're gonna watch some characters spy on each other. We're gonna watch them interact with one another. We're gonna have two characters stand on a rock and talk gossip about their boss. We're gonna learn about <laughs> who these people are and why they're doing what they're doing, and then conclude with now they're fighting again, right? It wasn't just th- twenty one minutes of battling. It was like actually the battles are pretty short. But they're um, but they're they're spread out in just enough places so that like as a little kid you'd never get tired of what's happening and the characters are really vibrant so that like mm-hmm. you you get everything you need to know like well here's Soundwave he's really mysterious and strange and he has these people who live in his chest here's Reflector who is a super oddball <laughs> um, that makes you wonder what the deal is with him right. Yeah, it's that thing that Sunbow did so well with G.I. Joe. It's like, let's have these characters immediately come across on screen. Mm -hmm. You know, they boil down the essence to basically tell you everything you need to know in one sentence or so about this character. And there you go. Here it is, served up on a plate. And by the way, here's 20 or so new characters, kids. Enjoy. Yeah, yeah, and and something that Dan Mishkin recently, Dan Mishkin, comic book writer, a friend of mine, uh, recently reminded me of is that you should never have a line of dialogue that is just pure exposition. It shouldn't be a line of dialogue that just tells you what needs to happen next in the story. It always should be said in a way that reveals something about that character. Uh, and so that's something the show does a lot. I mean, there's there's a couple of expositional lines in this first episode, but for the most part, everybody's delivering something to make you wonder about that character. And I think that's one of the reasons the toy line was as, as successful as it was, is it had a really dynamite commercial uh, in the in the form of this show. Mm-hmm. So you didn't want to just get Thundercracker because he was a cool blue jet. You wanted to get Thundercracker because you really liked this gravelly voiced old guy who hung out in <laughs> smoke breaks with reflector. <laughs> You know. And man, I always wanted Thundercracker, and I I didn't get him for a long time. I got my Thundercracker through mail order. It's like oh when, wow, when they started to do like the here kids, you can order the Power Dashers, and you can order Sunstreaker and Thundercracker, and a couple other 
uh, season one type guys. It's like I didn't get mine till then. It's like Skywarp I had for a long time, and then I got Starscream, and then I just never got Thundercracker until that mail order came along. Of course, that was only mm. like the span of a year, possibly two. But as a kid, it just seemed <laughs> like a, a million years. <laughs> yep, in kid it's years like, that I was like fifty have years. Thundercracker. <laughs> All right, there's episode one. So uh, come back next week and we'll get to the next part of the series at More Than Meets the Eye, episode two. Thank you, Hoover. Thank you, Jersey. (laughs) Okay, bye. Bye. Episode synopses are from imdb.com and some episode information taken from tfwiki.net. The closing theme is by Nick Mahalik based on the original closing theme by Ford Kinder and Ann Bryant. You can find more of Nick's music at soundcloud.com slash Nicholas dash That's spelled N-I-C-H-O-L-A-S dash M-E-H-A-L-I-C-K. Find us on Facebook under 4 Million Years Later, and you can email us at 4 Million Years Later at gmail.com. Visit 4millionyearslater.com, and if you haven't yet, please subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. You know how it works. <laughs>